Let's just take these prayer requests to the Lord. Please heal my sinus condition. Please take depression from me and fill my heart with joy. Remove cancerous polyps and restore finances. Please pray for Ashley's recovery from breast cancer. My cousin is in the hospital with fluid on the brain. Please pray that God will heal her. And then please pray for me that the Lord will give me total recovery after, after surgery. Let's just hold these before the Lord. And here's a thought. As we come to him in prayer, just think to yourself, how big is possible? How big is that? For with God, all things are possible. So in his presence now, we go boldly to the throne of grace and we, we lay out before him these requests. For he is a miracle working God. And he has so much more for us. So Lord God, stretch forth your hand to do miracles. Heal those who are sick. We break depression over their minds and their spirits now, and we speak righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Lord, for those with financial need, Lord, show them the abundance that you have stored for them and how you will provide their every need according to your riches and glory. Now, Lord, we're bold enough to ask for even more of you. More, Lord God, more. More revelation, more insight. Teach us to pray. Teach us to be like you. Open our eyes, Lord God. Open our ears. Open our hearts so that we can understand the greatness of your power towards us who believe. Lord, we believe. Now help our unbelief. And be with us now, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. We have a special treat all the way from Chicago, one of the fastest growing churches in America. So Pastor Chaco, come and share the word with us. Thank you. Well, praise the Lord. May the Lord bless you this morning. I've always looked life with perspective. You can either have this, the rain or... You can have the snow from Chicago. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'll take the rain. Hey, what a joy to be in Virginia, to be with you all here today and to share uh, what, how good God is. And I just want to let you know that God is not dead. Come on, I'm going to say that again, give you an opportunity to say amen. I want to let you know that God is not dead. Yeah. I spoke to him this morning. God is doing amazing things around the world. Every Sunday in Chicago, people are coming to Jesus. People are getting baptized, coming to the cross. And we're in this prayer week here, and I want to talk to you a little bit about the power of prayer. But there comes a time where prayer must convert to action. I believe in prayer. We're 24-hour prayer in Chicago. We believe God's going to do something in the United States, and we do not want to miss it. Come on, somebody. Now, you need to help me out because back in my church in Chicago, people respond with me. Come on now. I believe in the power of prayer, but prayer must convert to action. The year is 2002. I was just two years into my pastoring, small church in Chicago in the hood, the commander of the 14th precinct of the police department came to me and said, Reverend, we have an epidemic. We have an epidemic of prostitution. Is there anything your church can do? And like a good Christian, I said, Commander, we're going to pray for you guys. Now, I remember going home and telling my wife, Elizabeth, 
Elizabeth, there is an epidemic in Chicago of prostitution. They've arrested over 600 women in nine months, unduplicated, for prostitution. And I remember going to sleep. And when I woke up the next morning, I felt like the Lord said, Now, Choco, I want you to buy a farm. Now, you need to know I'm in the community of Humboldt Park, predominantly Puerto Ricans. And I went to my church that following day, and I, and I even woke up that morning and told my wife, Elizabeth, Babe, I think God wants me to buy a farm. And she said, what do you know about farming? I said, nothing. But I know about obedience. I know about obedience. My, my heavenly father. Now, many of you may not know my story. My father abandoned my mother, six children in Hubble Park, the worst park in the United States in the 1970s. I'm the youngest of six. I am like Gideon, the youngest of my tribe. And when I got saved at 14, he became my father. And I've always known to obey my father, even when it doesn't make sense. Because I've told people that understanding can wait, but obedience cannot. So I went to my church that following Sunday, and I said, Church, somebody here has a farm. Now, it's a small church at that time in 2002, a couple hundred people by the time we've grown. And I said, Somebody here has a farm. Give it up. That's how we collect offerings in church, too. I don't know how you do it here in Virginia, but we're like, hey, give it up. Don't play. I said, somebody who has a farm, give it up. My wife was the worship leader. I said, come on, babe, lead worship. After service, no one came to me. I went the following Sunday. I said, now, serious. We've got, we got an epidemic. Because I'm a firm believer that with, with revelation comes responsibility. Once God reveals to you the condition of your community, it's no longer that you have to pray. Now you have to do something about it. Come on, baby, worship. Following that Sunday, nobody came to me. One month passed by. Two months passed by. Three months. You ever, have, ever been in that place where you're like, I really thought I heard God. I mean, he's my father. I know his voice. Four months. And I come back. I say, guys, serious. Who has a farm? Come on, baby, worship. Seven months passed by, eight months, make a long story short, on the eighth month after service on Sunday, a lady comes to me and says, Pastor Choco, uh, my uncle, his wife of 42 years, just passed away in Cambridge, Illinois, and he's heard that you are looking for a farm, and, and that's 15 acres, he's selling it for $160,000, and I said, this is it. I remember that Monday going to the farm to see the, the 15 acres with my wife Elizabeth and some of the elders of the church. I walked around the 15 acres, and I said, Thus saith the Lord, this is the farm. And uh, now the camera people, you better follow me because I'm a mover. In my church, I like to move around the yard so I can slap them. <laughs> I said, thus saith the Lord, this is the farm. And so that you would know that God is with me, he's going to send me the money cash. Now let me just give you an insight here in Virginia about us Hispanics. We believe the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Complete Bible. And when the Bible says he has a cattle on a thousand hills, I said as his son, sell the cattle and send me the money to Chicago because you don't need cattle. Make a long story short, I get excited. I go to the church on Sunday. I said, church, it's 180 miles from Cambridge, Illinois to Chicago. I'm going to run from the farm. I'm going to run from the farm, ride bike. It's going to take me three days. You know, I'm getting all excited. I'm going to run from the farm, ride bike, and we're going to do something for these women. After service, my wife comes up to me and says, come over here, babe. I need to talk to you. She says, you're not a runner. You're going to die in the first mile. I said, I know. Jesus said, if you try to preserve your life, you've lost it. But if you lose your life for me, you find it. And I remember in the first 10 mile, my children were there. Every two miles, I had my kids there. And I was running. I was running for these women. I don't even know who they are because I'm a firm believer that no woman is born a prostitute, not even Rahab. Something has to happen. And I remember every two miles, my kids were there. And, uh, and as I was getting through the two-mile mark, my kids were there and giving me Gatorade. Come on, puppy, you can do it. You can do it on the four-mile mark. You know, my other daughter, my youngest daughter was there with water. Come on, Bobby, you can do it. On the eight-mile mark, my son was there. By this time, my back is hurting. My ankles are swollen. My knees are hurting. And he's like, come on, Bobby, you can do it. And I'm like, shut up, man. Give me the, give, give me the Gatorade. 
Anyway, it took me three days, and uh, me and my brothers, we ran, we rode bike, we got to Chicago. The police were there giving me an escort, yada, yada, yada. I get to the church. The church is full of people. I went to the accountant, and I said, tell me, how much did we raise? He said, oh, Pastor Choco, sit down. I said, no, tell me. He said, we only raised 13000 I said, you mean 113? He said, nope, 13000 I left the accountant. We go up to my office and, you know, close the door. Now I have a discourse with my father. Hey, just kill me. Why make me run for 13000 Yada, yada, yada. The phone rings. It's a man from Lombard, Illinois. Hey, Pastor Choke, I heard you have a shelter for homeless women and children. I said, I do. I have 35 homeless women and children that live with us. He said, I want to give you a washer and dry for the shelter. I said, come on in. He comes the next day. They unloaded the truck. And as they're unloading the truck, he comes to my office with his wife and says, so tell me about the run. He says, I told him about the 600 women. I told him that with revelation comes responsibility. And that when God reveals to you the condition of your community, you got to go on. And I started telling him that every two miles, my kids were there giving me Gatorade and water. He starts crying. His wife starts crying. He stands up. He said, Pastor Choco, I haven't even talked to my wife. I know it's beginning of December, but if you and your church can raise $40,000, my wife and I will give you $50,000 cash. I said, bless the Lord. I did what any pastor would do. The following Sunday, I went to the church. I said, church, somebody here has (laughs) $40,000. Give it up. Come on, babe, leave worship. I mean, why, why, why stop? It worked the first time. December 31st comes. I'm short $10,000 in Chicago. It's 9 o'clock in the night. December 31st, three hours before midnight. I got three hours to collect $10,000. A small church. I said, church, I'm short $10,000. Somebody here has $10,000. Give it up. Give it to the Lord. Come on, baby, leave worship. At midnight, a husband and wife comes to me and says, Pastor, we've been watching you for nine months. Running for women you don't even know. Giving your life away. Here's $10,000. Go buy this farm and save these women. And we were able to purchase a farm to the glory of God. And I say this because from that time to today, we've got eight women there now as I speak at the farm. We've rescued women who are in prostitution or human trafficking, over 623 women to the glory of God. The Bible says in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, for the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. And there has been a perversive spirit of hopelessness growing in our nation today. Everywhere. We are seeing in the news, we're we're hearing it in our workplaces. We're, we're reading in our newspaper and that can cause dismay. But we're the church of Jesus Christ. And we must see what's going on in our nation today as an opportunity. Hear me out. For the church to express hope and love to a drifting culture. It's possible for humans to live 40 days without food and perhaps five days without water and maybe five minutes without air. But we cannot live now one second without hope. I remember one day I told one of our pastor, female pastors in the church, and I said, I want you to go out and give me five prostitutes. Now, I know this is being seen all over, and, and you people are wondering why are they bringing this Puerto Rican guy from Chicago. And she looked at me and says, Pastor Choco, you want me to do what? I said, I want you to go out to the streets of Chicago and find me five women and ask them how much they would charge for one hour of service. And she said, Pastor Choco. I said, I want you to do it, go. She gets in her car, comes back two and a half hours later. Five women, African-American, Hispanic, mini skirts, they're drugged up. And they get out of her car and they're just leaning on her car. And she comes to me and she says, Pastor Choco, the tall one, she's going to charge you $50 an hour. The other one is 40, the other one's 35, 30, boom, boom, boom. It was like $220 for all five of them. I said, no problem, I got it. So I went into my pocket, got my, the money, I said, here's your $50, and here's your, here's your $40, your 35, boom, boom, boom. And one of the girls got out of the line and said, what do you want us to do? I said, I want you to come with me. And I walked them into the church. And in the church, I had 
a table set up like a banquet with roses and candles. And one by one, I pull out their chair and I said, now sit, please. I bought your time for one hour. I'm going to tell you about a man named Jesus that loves you dearly. I'm going to tell you about a man named Jesus that can save you and transform your life. One by one, I pull out the chair. Watch this. One by one, they sat. And for one hour, my wife led worship. In case you're wondering, she was there with me as well. Because the devil is a liar. Amen. As people put this on Facebook, I can't believe that my wife was with me the whole time. She led worship, and, and there's a discipleship program we have in the church, and they did human videos and so forth. I gave a 15-minute devotion, and after the one hour, I said, ladies, I bought your time for one hour. The hour's up. Thank you for coming. They stood up and said, preacher, no man has ever treated us this way. We don't want your money. Here's your money. Today, some of those ladies are elders in our church, <laughs> ministers of our church, deacons of our church. I'm trying to teach you here this morning. That prayer must convert to action. There is a cost from reconciliation. And someone has to pay so that others can be reconciled to their father. And the Bible says in Luke chapter 19 verse 10. For the son of man came to seek and save that which is lost. And the Bible says in Luke chapter 15. I want to talk to you about the three parables in Luke chapter 15. You would miss the radical message if you think that there are independent parables. But they're really connected. And let me just go through it quickly for you. The first parable is about the sheep. The lost sheep, there's 100. The guy loses one. He leaves the 99. Doesn't make sense financially. Why leave the 99 at risk and go after the one? And what the Bible doesn't tell you and I is that why is the one lost? Maybe he's in the corner somewhere. Bah. The music was too loud. The pastor didn't say hi to me today. Bad. You know how people are. But the Bible doesn't tell us. All we know is that the man leaves the 99 and he goes and he finds the one. And when he finds the one, he rejoices. And he says, rejoice. Because that which is lost is now found. Now the Bible says that Jesus is speaking to two groups. Notice. The sinners and tax collectors. That's one group. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Another group. So please understand, there's two groups here. Um, sinners, <laughs> tax collectors, Pharisees, teachers of the law. That's this group. And Jesus is sharing the parable of Luke chapter 15. And then he goes on to the second parable. The woman who loses the coin. And she is looking frantically for this one coin, y'all. This one coin, she's flipping furniture. You ever lost anything? Have you ever lost your wallet, your keys to your car? And you're like, nobody move. And she's looking because it really speaks about her character. You know, she would have 10 coins around her head, and it would represent her diary. And if the husband was coming, the groom is coming. And if he only saw nine around her, he could technically take her to her father and say, your daughter is irresponsible. But she's looking for this one coin that is lost. And then the Bible says, as Jesus is sharing to the two groups, can you imagine this group? You are the sinners and the, you know, and the tax collectors. You're like, ooh, child, I hope she finds it because I know what it is to lose things. You're a little bit more sympathetic. But in this group, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, if that was my wife, I'll divorce her right now. Nah. And then Jesus says, and the woman, I'm paraphrasing, she finds it. She calls all her friends on Facebook. Let's rejoice because that which is lost is now found. Then he gets to the third parable, which is my point this morning. It's the parable of the lost son. It is my opinion that not one son is lost, but both of them are prodigal. One in his sin and one in his religious ways. You know the story. The guy goes to the father and says, give me my inheritance. He's essentially really dissing his father. He's essentially saying to his father, I wish you were dead. Because the only way you get an inheritance is when the father is dead. And he's essentially insulting the father. And, can, and the father in Luke chapter 15, he's a picture of God. And he's telling to the boy, mijo, 
everything I have is yours. You don't have to do this. And the boy, the young boy, he's like, get out of here. I just want what belongs to me. And anyway, make a long story short, he gives it to the boy. And the Bible says that the son went out and lived a wild life. In Spanish, la vida loca. And he splurged everything, y'all. And then he finds himself in a predicament like many of us sometimes. He finds himself watching pigs eat, and he's desiring that. And then he says to himself, boy, I'd just rather go back to my father's house and just be a servant. I don't even have to be his son. Watch this. Then he gets up. He gets up. Can you imagine this group? The tax collectors and the sinners about the boy like, ooh, man, I hope that boy, I know what it is to run away. I've been there. And can you imagine this group? If that was my son, I'd drag him by the hair to the town and let the men stone him for disrespecting me. And so Jesus says that the boy gets up. As a matter of fact, Luke chapter 15, verse 17 says, and the boy came to his senses. Something woke up. He gets up. He heads home. Father sees him. The Bible says, and the father, when he saw the boy, he started running. You say, well, Pastor Choco, what's the big deal? It's a big deal because men don't run. Women run, children run in the first century. But it was undignified for a man to run. But then Jesus flips culture and says, and the father, when he saw the boy, he ran to him. And he called the servant, bring me a robe. Bring me a sandal. Put a ring on him. The boy's like, I got a speech. Don't you want to hear my speech? <laughs> and the boy, listen, listen. The Bible says that the father embraced him. It's my opinion that when the father embraced him, he was essentially telling all the men in the town, if you're going to stone him, you got to hit me first. Boy, I tell you, you could preach that stuff. That's the love of God when he embraces us. He loves us so much that he embraces us. Hey, hey, let's just call the marachi band. We're going to have a banquet. And music is playing in the house and the you can smell the food, and the servants are running back and forth. And guess who comes from the field? The older brother. As he's coming, he hears the marachi band and smells the food like, what's going on up there? And the servant says, you haven't heard? Heard what? Your brother? He's home. What do you mean he's home? Yeah, your dad, he killed a calf. And boy, we're having a banquet. The whole town is coming. The servant goes inside the house to the kitchen, goes to the father and says, bro, you got drama. Your older son is outside, and he's not coming in. Father says, don't worry, I'll take care of this. He goes out to the yard and says, mijo, come on in. All these years I've been faithful to you, and you never gave me a calf. You never killed a calf. The father says, everything I have is yours. Notice that the son, if you read the scripture, never comes into the banquet. Never comes into the banquet. So religious. I started thinking, I did my research on this culture and why. It's amazing that in this culture, when the younger son took the inheritance, it should have been the older son who went to the father and said, hey, dad, I know my little brother is a knucklehead, and I know you love him, and no matter what it costs me, I'm going to find him, and I'm going to bring him back home to you. Because you love him. And he never does that. When you read in Luke chapter 15 in the third parable, I don't know about you, but you yearn for a brother who cares about you. Somebody. And I'm thinking to myself, like you are, why is he upset? And then I figured it out. I know why he's upset. Because someone has to pay for this banquet. And do, who do you think that the ring belongs to? And the sandal. And the, who's paying for the marachi band? Who's paying for the food from his inheritance? And he doesn't want to pay so that his little brother would be reconciled with his father. Look at me for a moment. It's amazing, church. It's amazing that someone was looking for the sheep. Someone was looking for the coin. But nobody was looking for the boy. And we become a culture that looks for money and food. And yet Jesus tells us in Luke chapter 19, for the Son of Man came to seek and save that which is lost. Nobody was looking for the boy. 
there's a cost. Whatever church you go to, wherever you minister to, it's not enough, in my humble opinion, it's not enough just to pray. We must convert our prayer to action. Our prayer should lead us to engage culture in the world we live on. And there's a world out there that's waiting for leadership. Who's going to lead? That's you. That's you. But you're going to pay. You may not pay the $220 that I pay for the women, but you will pay. What would you pay, by the way? What would you pay for your little brother to come to know Jesus? What would you pay for your sister or your mom and dad to come to the knowledge of Jesus? What? You would probably say, Pastor Joe, I'll pray whatever it is. It's going to cost you. Let me finish here this morning. My father abandoned me at the age of eight. I've not seen him in 40-some years. He lives in Camden, New Jersey. I get the news in Chicago. They're about to amputate his legs. And I said to my sister, remember, I'm the youngest. I said, let's just bring Pop to Chicago and see if the doctors can do something different. We bring him from Camden, New Jersey to Chicago. And here's this man in my house, 88 years old. I'm changing him. Changing him, taking off his shoes. Never had a relationship with him in my life. And I'm thinking to myself, what would it cost? I'll do whatever it costs so that this man would come to know Christ. Even if it is to change him. Whatever it costs. A month later, there he is living with me and my wife. and Legs never got amputated to the glory of God. A few weeks ago, I say this to tell you this. A few weeks ago, he goes, he goes to Camden, New Jersey. And we have a campus in Camden, New Jersey. And a few weeks ago, they send me a picture of my father worshiping the Lord like this. To the glory of God. There is a cost. There is a cost of reconciliation. And sometimes we're so religious in our religious ways that we miss the opportunity to be Jesus to people who are hurting. If there was ever a time in our culture today is now where the church must be the church. You hear me? Listen, y'all. When Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 that you and I are the salt and the light of the world, that wasn't a compliment. That was a responsibility. It wasn't for you and I to say, well, that's great. Well, I'm the salt and light. No, no, no. It's a responsibility that we are to bear. That when people look at you and they look at me, they should be thirsty for Jesus. So I want to challenge you today. In this time, this week of prayer, and things present themselves to you. Remember this sermon. The cost of reconciliation. Someone has to pay. So that others would be reconciled. So we opened up the farm. And, and people found out we had a farm. And then we started getting calls from moms and dads who wanted to give us their teenage girls. And we opened up a teen center. And we take in girls that are 14, 15 years old. And their parents sign them over to us. We become their legal guardian because they're out of control. I say this because uh, last year there was one of our girls who's been with us for four years. She goes to her prom, African-American, cute girl. She's been with us for like four years, and she goes to her prom, and, and, and the staff at the house says, hey, Pastor Choco, her date's about to come to pick her up. Well, I said, well, I want to meet him like a father. So I get to there, and there she is, beautiful. The date comes. I said, I want you to know she has a father. I don't want her back here after 12 o'clock. She needs, not 12.01. She needs to be here at 11.59. I want her to know that she has a father. Someone has to pay. Someone paid for this prom dress. That's the church. Someone paid for her dentist and so forth. That's the church. And today she's uh, going to be a minister of our fellowship to the glory of God. There's a cost of reconciliation. <laughs> Would you stand with me? Stand with me this morning. Stand with me this morning. God has called each and every one of us to pay. You've learned here this morning that it's not enough just to pray, but look for the opportunity to engage culture. Do not be afraid of this culture. God is with you. 
Come on. God is with you, and he will give you the power to engage this culture. I understand that we have been the minorities. Christians have been the minority in our culture now, the last perhaps decade. In the 50s and the 60s, Christianity would set culture. But now we are called out of step counterculture. And I love it. I love it that you and I are in the minorities. Because one man, one woman with God is the majority. And God is with you. The average homeless person in America, he's not 35. He's nine years old. The girl who's being trafficked, she's not 18. She's five. We had a girl in our farm who's five years old, and she was trafficked by her mother until she was 11. And then she started trafficking her sister. I'm just telling you, there's a, there's a world out there, and we must pay so that others can be reconciled with our Heavenly Father, just as you have been reconciled with our Heavenly Father. Would you bow your heads for a moment? Let me pray for you. As you engage this culture today, as you go back to your jobs and family members, I pray that God would move you, not only to pray, but to act. Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you came to seek and save that which is lost. We thank you that you are our true elder brother, that you left your throne to find us in Humble Park in Virginia. And that you would give your life for us so that we can be reconciled with your Father. Thank you for Calvary. And today I pray blessings upon my brothers and sisters that as they engage this culture, this world, that they would know there is power. There's power. Bless them, dear God. Open their eyes to the needs of our culture today. And we promise to give you all the glory. And I'll be honored and praised. May the Lord bless you, and may the Lord guide you. And may the Lord shine his face upon you. And may the Lord be gracious unto you. And may the Lord give you peace. In Jesus' name, and the people of God said, Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for coming out today. Love you all.